morning, everyone. It's just about good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. I appreciate those of you that brought your canoes because you're going to need them leaving. It just started to rain again. <clears throat> I know, pouring down rain. Um, I want to welcome all of you to the last Government Affairs Forum for 2015. That would lead you to believe then that there isn't going to be one in December, right? So you can take it off your calendar. The um, presenting sponsors today, those of you that have come in the past know our presenting sponsors, but I want to remind you who they are. And I'm going to start with Keith today. I'm going to start with our media sponsor, Metro East Community Media. Keith Thomas is the one that is um, with us today, and he does the media for us every month. And evidently, last month, I said something really stupid about the company name, and I'm not sure what it was, but that's why it's in big font. It's in 16 font right here, so that I didn't mess it up. I also want to thank our education sponsor, Gresham Barlow School District. And a special thank you to our presenting sponsors. Larry, please tell your board we appreciate it. Riverview Community Bank, that's one of my many bank, no, I'm teasing, one of my banks, I appreciate it. Thank you for your sponsorship. And Portland General Electric, we appreciate them as well. I also want to recognize the elected officials that are in the room. We have council member Kurt French is here. Hi, Kurt, nice to see you. And to his left or his right, depending on which way you're looking, is Mario Palmero. Thank you very much for coming. He said he likes to come because we have good food. I would agree that today we have exceptional food. I'd also like to recognize the chamber board members that are here today. The uh, past president, Matt Miller from Gresham Sanitary, where Matt, thank you for doing this today. And Lori Oki, who you may remember was our MC at the Economic Summit. Lori, thank you. She's with Adventist Health. Now many of you are wondering and are quite tempted by the display that's in front of you. How many of you have touched one of the Legos? There was lots of, there we go, lots of questions about why Legos. Well, Legos are tempting. You, they're not just for children. They're an adult temptation too. You want to you reach out and you want to put something together. And when you put it together, it's, oh, that doesn't quite fit. I want to put it together better or a different color or make it bigger or tear it apart and start it again. And that, to me, is symbolic of what we're doing in Rockwood. We are using this opportunity, just like Legos are an opportunity to build. We have an opportunity to build and to rebuild and to rebuild again whatever it takes just to get it better and better, just like Legos, building something bigger and better over and over. I'm hoping that we're not doing that Lego thing where we tear apart, but, but I'm sure we will. In fact, one of my, child, my grandchildren's favorite stores is a Lego store in Canby, and that's my goal is to get a Lego store in Gresham, because the gas alone kills me, let alone buying the product when we get there. With that being said, today is all about Rockwood, and I want to introduce the chair of our Government Affairs Committee, and it's Brian Lessler with PDG, PDG Construction Services. Would you change that name or, or pay for my teeth getting fixed so that I can, Brian, <laughs> do both, thank you. Please welcome Brian Lessler. Legos reminds me of my son. He got married about uh, three years ago, and we now have a one-year-old granddaughter. But after he got married, we finally delivered a mandate and said, you got to get your stuff out of the house. I mean, you know, <laughs> has anybody else ever dealt with that? <clears throat> well, he was a Lego freak growing up. I mean, every other week he had a new Lego thing, and he'd build these huge deals on our pool table so I could never play pool. And um, so when he moved out, he had these, you know, plastic uh, container boxes, about three of them, full of Legos. And I said, what are you going to do with all this stuff? And he says, well, I'm going to put it online and sell it. And I said, great, where's my cut on this? Because, <laughs> I mean, we spent thousands of dollars on Legos, I'm sure, over the years. But <clears throat> anyhow, he and took it. Well, I'm going to convince my granddaughter that uh, she should do something else besides Legos. But this is a great example, though. It's a great uh, illustration of, of what these gentlemen are here to talk about today. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Josh Fewer. Josh is a <clears throat> native Greshamite. He grew up in the Rockwood neighborhood. And uh, 
He has been an occasional stage actor, and um, he'll probably show some of those skills today, I bet. <clears throat> uh, Josh was appointed to a vacant Gresham City Council position in uh, 2009, and he enjoyed the challenges of being on that city council. But when the urban renewal director position became available, he resigned his council position to pursue uh, a dream job. Uh, he lives and breathes that community and has for years. You will soon see by his presentation that this is not just a job but a passion uh, from his head to his heart to his feet on the ground, making the right things happen in his own backyard. Please welcome Josh Fuhr. Thank you, Brian, for the wonderful introduction. Um, I'm told I only have 15 minutes, so I'm setting myself a timer here. Um, so I love the Lego analogy because growing up with Legos myself, I'm reminded that with Legos you can make anything you can imagine any way you want to imagine it. And the really great thing about a place like Rockwood is that it is very unique and the Legos don't have to be built in any kind of prescribed way. Every person who touches a box of Legos is going to make something different. And I think that's a really great analogy for what's happening in Rockwood now. Um, I'd like to share with you some of the things that the City of Gresham, the Gresham Redevelopment Commission, have been working on uh, as it relates to revitalizing the Rockwood neighborhood, specifically the town center. As you might remember, um, the uh, Rockwood Fred Meyer was acquired by the city about 10 years ago. Um, and there was an attempt to build a project on the site in 2007, 2008. We know what happened to the economy at that point. The project didn't move forward. So fast forward several years, and um, we are in a unique position to take one of the most, if not the, actually it is the most economically challenged neighborhood in the entire state of Oregon and do something really special here. So we're trying to create an economic engine in the heart of Rockwood that doesn't exist today um, by empowering local entrepreneurs, by helping people to gain access to living wage jobs, and by filling the gap left by the, count them, six grocery stores that have left Rockwood and the immediately adjacent neighborhoods over the last 20 years. As somebody who grew up in Rockwood, uh, I remember Kino's. I remember the Fred Meyer. We used to go there three times a week when I was a kid. Uh, we've lost the Safeway at 162nd and Division, another one at 181st and Halsey. Uh, we lost the QFC at 182nd and Powell. And yet, the population of Rockwood has been growing over the last 20 years, while the number of grocery options has been shrinking. So we have an opportunity to address that in a really, uh, I hope, meaningful way. So our project plan really focuses on three areas. The first is workforce, entrepreneurship, and technology. We want to create a hub for folks in the local community to gain access to the skills that will get them a living wage job in the manufacturing or technology sectors. Uh, we have major employers in the manufacturing sector in Rockwood today who can't fill positions that are open because they can't find skilled labor. At the same time, we have people in the community who can't get access to living wage jobs and are living in poverty because they don't have those skills. That presents an opportunity, and we're going to address that in the project. We're also going to support local entrepreneurs to start or expand local small businesses uh, to address the needs of the local community as well as create a great place that people from outside Rockwood actually want to come and spend time. Uh, and then finally, the uh, the Rockwood Town Center really needs to be a vibrant, mixed-use, pedestrian-friendly uh, environment with streetscapes that are buzzing with activity, um, local entrepreneurs whose merchandise spills out onto the street, and really creates the kind of pedestrian experience that will draw people in, uh, even from outside of Rockwood. So those are the three main areas that we're focused on with our project. Uh, this is a little site plan. This is going to change, uh, and I've got some slides here I'm going to buzz through pretty quickly just in the interest of time. Um, so the workforce development and entre entrepreneurship and technology piece uh, is really geared toward um, putting amenities in the community that will allow people to uh, see their own economic futures improve as the neighborhood improves. This is part of our anti-displacement strategy. So we talk a lot about in the Portland region about gentrification and displacement. One thing we don't want to do with this project is to put in a bunch of high-end condos and wine bars and raise 
the property values to the point where people in Rockwood can't afford to live there anymore and they get pushed out to the next neighborhood. Instead, what we want to do is empower the local community that's there to improve their own financial futures uh, so that their, their boats rise with the, with the rising tide. So we're looking at putting in a tech shop so entrepreneurs who have an idea about a widget that they want to make can go in, design their widget, go into the carpentry lab, the metals fabrication lab, use the 3D printers and laser cutters to make their thing, and then work with the small business development center that will be relocated on our site uh, to actually build a business around that. At the same time, the tech shop will work with local entrepreneur, or I'm sorry, with local employers uh, to create certification programs for folks to gain the skills that they need on the types of equipment they would be using in a manufacturing environment so that they become qualified to get access to those jobs. So we have a tech shop uh, tenant in the project who's going to build out that piece. Uh, the Small Business Development Center, like I said, will relocate from downtown Gresham to our project in Rockwood on the old Fred Meyer site. Uh, and they will work with uh, Metro East Community Media and the Multnomah County Library as programmatic partners to program Metro East's uh, brand new TV production studio and digital innovation lab. So if you want to make an electronic or a digital product of some kind, if you're an entrepreneur in the media space, there's a resource there for you to go and use uh, to, to create your, your multimedia project, um, to work with the um, uh, small Business Development Center to market your small business. Uh, and then we also have WorkSource Oregon, uh, which will be relocating their field office from 194th and Stark to our site. Uh, they want to be closer to the max. They want to be closer to um, the tech shop that's going to be working with all these uh, manufacturers to skill up the labor force uh, so that when folks do gain those skills and those certifications, they have some place to go to actually get access to those jobs. And then finally, Ned Space is a co-working space for solo and creative entrepreneurs. They have an existing location at 174th and Sandy. Uh, they're going to relocate because they want to be near the SBDC. So no, no matter what color your collar, whether it's white, blue, or plaid, uh, whether you're an entrepreneur looking to start a new business or somebody who's looking to gain the skills to get access to a living wage job, all of the resources are here for you, whether you're talking about a digital uh, pursuit or a, a physical object you're trying to create uh, or gain the skills to make as an employee. So that's the workforce entrepreneurship and tech track. Some images there of what the makerspace and the tech shop could look like. Um, the food marketplace, as I said, we've lost six gro grocery stores out of Rockwood and the immediately surrounding area in the last 20 years. We could try to bring in another grocery store, another major chain grocery store to Rockwood, but we've tried that. We've not been successful. The mayor and I, two years ago, got on a plane and went down and met with Trader Joe's trying to bring them to Gresham. They told us, we're not going into any cities where we already have stores. And then they announced that they were going in on MLK. So that was, that was interesting. But the point is, we've talked to a number of chain grocery stores about coming into Rockwood. And they're leaving in droves. They're not looking to come in. So we're going to take a more entrepreneurial approach. And we're going to build a market hall, 10 to 12,000 square feet, with a half a dozen vendors, local small businesses, who each make up the major departments of a grocery store. So a meat vendor, a bakery vendor, a produce vendor, daily home essentials, paper towels and dish soap vendor. We even have a small uh, microbrewing operation that wants to brew beer in the market hall. Um, to serve as the anchor, as the grocery store component that the community lacks and, and desperately needs in the town center for local residents to come and do their weekly grocery shopping. That will sit on a public plaza that will be home to the farmer's market that's just finished their first full season. They're small, but they're growing. Uh, we want to create a, a place for them to, to grow and expand uh, on a permanent basis. And then we're going to build 20 incubator spaces. And this is really exciting. We're looking at taking either shipping containers or some other type of construction uh, modality to um, create incubator spaces where folks with nothing more than an idea can rent a space for a few hundred bucks a month try out a new product, launch a business on a shoestring, grow a following, and eventually transition into brick and mortar storefronts. I'm, I'm guessing about 75% of those will be food-based businesses to create the kind of um, marketplace, active, vibrant marketplace that will draw people in from outside of, of Rockwood. There are two stats about Rockwood that I think are really important to point out. Of the 38 town centers in the entire metro area, Rockwood has the youngest median age, and the greatest diversity. There are 88 languages spoken in the home in Rockwood. 
And when I heard those two stats for the first time, the first thought that occurred to me was, man, can you imagine what we can do with food in Rockwood? I think we have an opportunity to create a food ecosystem in Rockwood that looks nothing like the rest of the region. We have today, across the street from our site, an Uzbekistani restaurant. I don't know if any of you have been there, but if you haven't, it's actually really good. You should give it a shot. It's 185th and Burnside. And that's with any, without anybody at the city trying to make that happen. Now imagine if we were purposeful about it, the kind of, of food that represents the 88 languages that are in Rockwood could be phenomenal. And that's what we want to try to build. So um, it's really geared toward trying to create a food marketplace that will address the needs of the local population as well as draw people from outside of Rockwood in. So in the interest of time, here's a little sketch of what our marketplace could look like. The white, the white roof uh, here is our market hall. The yellow and the red are our incubator spaces. And you can see in the middle there you've got <coughs> the farmer's market. Um, I'm going to speed through a little bit of this. Um, uh, looking for local op entrepreneurs. We're not putting in Chipotle or Starbucks or any big major chains. We want local operators to solve a local problem uh, and to support local small businesses. And um, uh, the community benefits for this will, will touch everybody in the community from individuals looking for opportunities to employers looking for skilled labor to entrepreneurs looking to, to open a business to the general community at large seeing improvement in the Rockwood area. Um, we have a number of committed tenants. We have about a 100,000 square foot project of which we've already pre-committed. I won't say pre-leased, but I'll say pre-committed 70,000 square feet uh, with a couple more that are very, very close. Uh, and the balance of that mostly is the food businesses that are very hard to pre-lease because they have much shorter planning timelines. Um, we have about a $30 million project budget of which the city has about six and a half million dollars of tax increment financing. We're looking at about four million dollars of new market tax credits. We own the site free and clear. And so about half of the capital stack will be coming from sources other than the developer. So the project timeline, uh, we've been in, a, in a, an intense public engagement campaign since May. Uh, at Rock the Block, we kicked off our public engagement campaign. Uh, this past month, we put out a solicitation to the developer community to say, come partner with us. We need a partner to come actually build this project with the city of Gresham. We got three very qualified teams that submitted. Uh, we wrapped up uh, interviews, staff level interviews of those last week, and we're looking to bring a recommendation to the Redevelopment Commission two weeks from today with the idea of starting design after the first of the year and putting a shovel in the ground in October of next year with opening uh, in 17. And I think uh, I will leave it there for now. And uh, I, do I have a couple minutes for questions? I, I think we'd like to do, do those at the end. OK, great. You all are still going to be here. Perfect. Sounds good. I guess I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. As a developer and contractor myself, I just am amazed at heavy lifting that Josh and his team have done uh, with respect to this uh, project. It's really incredible. And there's been almost a decade of previous attempts to try to get to some point here. So congratulations, and I'm, I'm really proud of you. <laughs> Good job. Um, so our next speaker um, is no stranger to any of you, our Chief Craig Jenniger. Chief Jenniger grew up watching his grandfather leave for work in the blue suit of a uniformed police officer. Uh, that was an inspiration that has brought this very caring and determined man to Gresham to be our Chief of Police. <clears throat> in his professional life, he has done nearly every job in police departments from canine uh, crews to public relations to now being our chief of police. Um, I understand police officers, why they do things, chief said. I've been there, and we are glad that he is here. His leadership has made a huge difference in our policing and the safety of our homes and businesses, particularly in this challenging Rockwood community. Please welcome Chief Greg Jenniker. Well, thank you. and. Thank you for having me today, but I always seem to follow like the most eloquent speaker <laughs> that you have. And if you've listened to me before, that ain't me. <laughs> so 
I'm glad there's no Legos on my table because I can't build a thing. I have 10 of these things and my home in California, I built a storage shed. You know, I went down, got two by fours and everything and built it. It fell down like three years later, <laughs> literally crashed in my backyard. So I don't build things. So, but I do have two great big old plastic containers of Legos in our downstairs storage room that were my kids. And so I called them both several times and I said, hey, do you guys want your Legos? No, we don't want them. Okay, well, we're thinking to get, no, don't get rid of them. <laughs> we're gonna keep them probably till the day we die, but we've got our kids. Craigslist, they're worth a lot of money. Yeah, well, I don't think they'll let us, but <clears throat> anyway, uh, you know, it, it's good to hear all the good positive things that are happening in Rockwood. You'll hear it from Josh, and you'll hear it from Brad. You know, unfortunately, when we deal with law enforcement, it's not always the really good things that are going on. Rockwood, the Rockwood community continues to be a challenge for us. It does. Uh, the Rockwood community, and this is kind of what the police department considers from 202 on the east to 162 on the west, from Halsey on the north to division on the south. That's kind of what we think of as a Rockwood neighborhood. Now I know there's two or three different neighborhoods within that, but that's kind of what we think. So that area that I just described accounts for 35% of the police department's calls for service. 35%. So you figure that's about a four square mile area in a 24 and a half square mile city accounts for 35% of our calls for service. Now there's a reason for that and I'll get into that in a few minutes. But one of the things that we continue to struggle with is the gang violence in Rockwood. A lot of what's happened in Portland, uh, the gentrification has pushed a lot of their poverty, it's no secret, the mayor's spoken about it, and a lot of their gang issues out to where the apartments are more affordable. So what we found is that where Portland continues to have gang violence, we seem to be rising in gang violence. Four of our seven homicides this year have occurred in Rockwood and they've all been gang involved. Now, there's, I wanna make a point here that there's a difference between gang motivated and gang involved. And ours have been gang involved. Here's the difference. Gang, motiva gang motivated means African-American gangs, Bloods and the Crips, two different sets, okay? The Bloods and Crips shooting at each other, that's gang motivated. Gang involved is that in our homicides, either the suspect or the victim is a noted gang member. So two of them were domestic violence related where the suspect or the victim was a gang member. Two of them were just two people get into an argument and a fight in a parking lot in an apartment complex. One shoots the other one. One of them's a, ga a gang member, the victim or the suspect. So those aren't gang motivated. So if there's a silver lining to anything, that's the good thing. When you don't have gang motivated shootings, you're not gonna have the drive by, the, the reckless shootings within the community. They're pretty focused, they're at certain people. So that's, that's a good thing. We still struggle every two years to make sure that we get our gang funding from the state legislature. Every year I go down and every year, or every two years, I testify in front of the Ways and Means Public Safety Committee to get our funding. Luckily, we have some legislators that over the years, uh, Greg Matthews, Lori Monis Anderson, and now Carla Peluso, have put their best foot forward and guaranteed us our gang funding. But I've talked about it before. If we don't get that gang funding from the legislature, then we are trying to stem this tide or hold our arms up at 162nd while the city of Portland, that's six times bigger than us, can amass a whole lot of resources there and push it east. So that's what we're trying to do. When I talked about Rockwood being 35% of our, our calls for service. We had 74,000 
radio calls last year for a police department of 125 sworn. Now, if you do the math, that's a lot of radio calls. There's a lot of time. A study that was done just prior to me coming up here was that 80% of a police officer's time in the city of Gresham is spent reactive. That means responding to calls for service. It hasn't gone down since I've been here. So if you figure 80% of their, their work day, if they're on a 10 hour work day, eight hours of that day, they're responding to calls that are coming over that little box inside the car. Then you take away a little bit of time to eat because we got to eat because we don't hunt if we're hungry. And then you take away another half hour, 45 minutes to report riding. My cops are into overtime every day and all we're doing is reacting to calls for service. So when you look at the Rockwood community, <clears throat> we all know that the city of Gresham is, unless it's changed, is 49.8% rental housing. That means that almost 50% of all the residences in Gresham are rentals. Well, if you look at Rockwood, what is the majority of the Rockwood neighborhood? Now, a lot of them are single family dwellings, but what do we see? Huge apartment complexes. The problem that we have with most of the apartment complexes in the Rockwood area is that they're owned by out-of-state corporations that have never once set foot in the city of Gresham, much less probably Oregon. All they're doing is buying up these apartment complexes and all they care about is filling those apartments and they don't care who's filling them. So. What's interesting, if you drive around the Rockwood neighborhood and there's a lot of good apartment complexes that are clean, that are well kept, that we don't have a lot of calls in, does anybody know what the one thing that makes that difference? Strong owner, strong manager. They're willing to hold their tenants accountable and willing to evict them when they shouldn't be in those apartment complexes. So when I came up here, it's no secret, I've said it a lot, <clears throat> we had a rotten relationship with Home Forward, which used to be, what was it, Portland? Housing Authority of Portland. Housing Authority of Portland. We had just a rotten relationship with them. They wouldn't call us back. We couldn't have them hold their people accountable. Since I've been up here, we have developed a very strong relationship, with, which is now what is Home Forward, and the neighborhood enforcement team officers have that relationship. They meet with Home Forward once a month. <clears throat> they sit down with calls for service. They go over apartments that if we've had three or four calls in that apartment over the month, they'll bring it to Home Forward's attention and Home Forward is aggressively evicting these people. Now I know displacement is a big thing in the Portland area right now. But when my officers four or five times a month are responding out to the same exact apartment on a domestic violence issue, somebody's under the influence, whatever that thing is, you're taking two or three officers out of service for an hour at least. So we need to figure out, and we have, how to deal with that issue. Hey, I'm the first one. I don't want people kicked out on the streets either but I also have to be a good steward of public funds and make sure that we're doing the right things with our police officers. So we built that relationship. What our department started a couple of years ago was the neighborhood enforcement team. Two officers right now that their primary job is neighborhood livability issues. Hey, I understand that nobody wants gang violence, nobody wants murders in our streets, Nobody wants the robberies of all of our establishments or our homes broken into. But you know what? That is a small part of what really affects the quality of life in our community. Because I would guess right now there's probably no one in this room that's afraid at 9 o'clock at night to go to the ATM at Wells Fargo in downtown Gresham and draw money out. I don't think anybody is. But you know what? People in this room are either frustrated or scared to death of that house two or three doors down, that the kids have grown up to be knuckleheads, they're throwing parties, they're growing dope, there's gangsters living in there, whatever that is. 
So everybody is fearful of their neighborhood. That's what the neighborhood enforcement team is doing. And you know, I kind of coined it when we first formed the team, no call too small. And that's what I want them to do, to react to the good citizens in our city that are having a problem in their neighborhood. What has happened is that it has grown into a large portion of their time being spent in the multi-unit complexes in Rockwood. Because part of my direction was, I want you working on neighborhood livability issues, but I also want you spending some of your time focusing on those places that are labor intensive for us, meaning taking a lot of our resources. So they're focusing on apartment complexes. We have several of them on 190th right now that we're just going to day in and day out. So they're focusing on them. They're building a package on one of them on a public nuisance ordinance that eventually we can move down that road of holding them more accountable to maintaining their properties. So one of the good things that's happened out of the neighborhood enforcement team, I, I have probably the two best officers that could ever be in these positions right now, Jim Leak and Dan Estes. They are a round peg and a round hole, a square block and a square hole. Whatever you want to talk, whatever you want to say, they are the best. A couple of years ago, they came to me and they said, Chief, you know, what we're finding is that a lot of the apartment managers in Rockwood don't hold their uh, properties accountable. I said, okay. And they said, this is what we want to do. We want to start what we call a, a tenant landlord forum. And I go, do tell. Well, they said, we want to provide training every month for the landlords and tenants in these apartment complexes in Rockwood. Teach them how to do evictions. Teach them how to do rental uh, agreements. Tell them how to maintain their property. Tell them all this stuff. So once a month, they have the landlord tenant forum where they'll bring in a guest speaker. It might be an attorney to talk about evictions. It might be home forward to talk about something, whatever it is. So that was a success after the first year. Then they came to me and they said, so we want to build upon that, okay? And, and you know the great thing is, I love having people with creative ideas, and I just say, do it. And they, they get it done. That's what's great about A-type personality cops. So they said, we want to build upon that. I said, what do you want to do? Well, it's going to cost some money, Chief. Well, tell me what you want to do first, and I'll tell you if I'm going to spend the money. And they said, we want to do an eight-hour training that we invite all of the, the landlords from the Rockwood community or the entire city in for a full eight hour day of training and we want to bring a nationally recognized speaker in. Jeez, three minutes already? We want to bring a nationalized recognized speaker in to talk about property management and neighborhood livability of your properties. So we started that three years ago. The first time we had 35 people show up, which is pretty good. When you figure at our council meetings, we have nobody show up. <laughs> I know it's streaming online. That's why nobody shows up. Second year, we had 60 people. This past year, we had too many people to fill the chairs. We have to find a bigger place to do it. So it's taking off, and we're starting to see the rewards of what we're doing. One of the things that, you know, since I've been up here, I have had to count erasers, pencils, and every dollar and cent that's been accounted for in the police department. It's just the way it's been since I've been up here. You know, I call it the depression era I've lived through as a police chief. But this past year, it's actually encouraging. The budget is improving, the neighborhood's improving, things are coming in, we're getting things done in the Rockwood neighborhood and all around the city. The city council gave me two more positions to make two more net officers, which is good because they are truly making a difference. And thank you, counselors, for, for doing that. They also gave me a half-time admin pr position because those two officers are spending a lot of their time in the office gathering data and entering data. This person can do that. So. Counselors don't know about it yet, but I have a presentation in front of council next month on my neighborhood livability. But what the plan is, 
that we had the Broken Windows Task Force, which is a combination of the Police Department, Fire Department, City Attorney's Office, uh, Code Enforcement, and Rental Housing. What we want to do is the Broken Windows Task Force on steroids. It's now going to become the Community Livability Team, and that team is going to comprise all those people, but it's going to be broken up into two separate teams. You'll have two officers, Code Enforcement, Rental Housing, City Attorney, and a Fire Marshal, to work on single family dwellings. The other team, can you guess? Multi-unit dwellings with a focus of those apartment complexes that are still using a ton of our resources. So there's good things in store uh, coming with that. Uh, hopefully we can decrease our calls for service. I guess my time's up according to that and I don't want to infringe on Brad's time. But anyway, uh, we're open for questions afterwards. Good things are happening in Rockwood, and <clears throat> Brad Ketch is here to tell us about some of the things that he's up to. Brad is also a local Greshamite. Uh, he graduated from Centennial High School and has been on the board of directors of my father's house for a number of years. Uh, Brad left the corporate world where he had a 25-year work history uh, as an executive in the telecommunications uh, hardware industry and started Community Development Corporation of Oregon. His intellectual talents were used in the corporate world, but in his new work environment, Brad says he is more fulfilled as he uses his heart combined with his gifts and talents to make a different difference on a more local level. And that commitment is coming to life in the changes he is making to Rockwood. Please welcome Brad Ketch. Thank you, Brian. Everybody, you have some sheets of paper there on your table. Um, those of you who are on the back nine over there aren't going to be able to see these charts, so this material follows uh, the charts. And I'm going to go really fast. We've got a lot of information, hardcore information, um, and I'm not intending to overwhelm. I'm just intending to let you know what's available to you for analysis. If you want to be in conversation with us later, that's great. Um, I did want to mention before I started, first of all, Chief, that the neighborhood enforcement team, those officers have made a very meaningful difference in Rockwood. We see it every single day, and I really want to thank you for your commitment to that. <laughs> and I also want to uh, call out Jack in the back there. Um, if you guys don't know Jack, he is the executive director, or the director, the, what are you? Okay, For, uh, Friends of the Children has a major new facility in Rockwood. Do you guys all know that? Go there. They did their uh, ribbon cutting, or open house on Friday. Senator Wyden was there. Very impressive. It's a major new asset for the, all of us of the Rockwood community. So we thank Friends of the Children. So uh, the Rockwood Community Development Corp, this is what our staff looked like this summer. Isn't that a great shot? Um, you know, Rockwood, is, as uh, Josh Fuhrer mentioned, is the most diverse neighborhood in all of Oregon. It's also um, a neighborhood that uh, has both great challenges and great opportunities. Uh, there is technically no place called Rockwood. Uh, there's a Rockwood Neighborhood Association, but we use the exact same uh, geographic boundaries that the police department use. From our point of view, it fits six census tracts exactly, so all the data that you're going to hear about is just fits really well with that. I think on these boundaries, the most important one is the on the left side. The western boundary of Rockwood is the eastern boundary of the city of Portland. And the amount of resources that are available for low-income people on a per capita basis is probably 15 times on the left side of that line than it is on the right side of the line. So uh, we really have a dramatic situation where if you live on the west side of 162nd and you're a low-income person, you're an immigrant, you're a refugee, you have a lot of supports and resources that you just simply don't have when you're in Gresham. Um, and what that has done is it's given us a community that is pretty alarming uh, when you look at it. There's a, I'm going to introduce you to a couple of, of data points you probably don't know about. It was new to me. There's an organization called Truven. In the medical world, it's, they do data analytics, um, 
um, all the major health systems use them for everything. And they have a community need index where they take all these parts of life, whether it's your health or your economic vitality or crime or whatever, and they boil all this data down to just a scale of one to five. And one is kind of like, like, like Oswego. There is one five in Oregon, and that's Rockwood. Another indicator, the Department of uh, Housing and Urban Development, HUD, uh, has various indices for measuring what kind of shape a neighborhood is in. RECAP is a racial and ethnic profile. And to be a RECAP community, you have to be over 50% people of color, and you have to be greater than 40% poverty. Guess where the one RECAP community in all of Oregon is? That's Rockwood. So we have a clear and a compelling reason to do something different than what's been done before. As Josh Fuhrer mentioned, you know, it's not all bad news. It's a kick. There's 88 languages spoken at Rockwood. There's incredible ethnic and, and uh, immigrant and refugee diversity that we think is, is um, part of the future that we embrace. Uh, now, how did we get this way? You know, historically, I, by the way, I grew up on 143rd and Stark, and my kids went to Centennial High School, too. We lived just two miles south of Rockwood. Um, historically, this was a white flight neighborhood. That's why my parents moved into the Rockwood, or just west of the Rockwood area uh, in the 1960s. And it was unincorporated Multnomah County at that time, um, as, as others have alluded to, poor housing quality, cheap rents. And in 1987, um, and it was basically a commuter community. So there's, there's kind of, I mean, there is a downtown Rockwood, but not really. It's kind of designed to just drive through on your way to jobs in Portland. So they're never, we're not trying to recreate a downtown that used to exist. This is brand, there never, never, really has never been one. Um, in 1987, the court ordered Rockwood into Gresham, and that was um, greater than 73% negative sentiment from Rockwood residents. So it was kind of a train wreck all the way back then. Right around that time, the max opened up, and coincidentally, just this, this confluence of events, the city of uh, Portland also started the forced displacement of African Americans from North Portland. So they all went to Rockwood, and at the same time, and it, it created a resulting crisis that started to hit us in the 1990s, and is, you know, frankly, with us today. Um, the infrastructure out here was never designed to support low-income immigrant and refugee lifestyles. And um, the cultural centers for people of color weren't here. Uh, you know, it's just a historically um, a white community. Um, the legacy people who still live in Rockwood, my parents' generation, are angry. They're angry about falling property values. They're angry about crime. And a desire, you know, quite honestly, for their new neighbors to, wherever you came from, go back. We, we want to reclaim our community. So that's, you know, that's, this is harsh. This is the harsh part of my talk because it's turning around. There's great things happening. But this is currently still our reality. Now, poverty doesn't have to be associated with violence, but in the case of Rockwood, it has been. And it doesn't have to be associated with human sex trafficking, but in the case of Rockwood, it has been. So. You know, the question, when I first started to learn about Rockwood, you know, we started to move into the neighborhood. Our office is right there on 192nd and Stark. And we started, you know, who are these people? Who are these displaced folks? What do they want? What can we do about it that's different? Um, the, the ones who are, are the new arrivals that are displaced from Portland are still, we find they're still looking back to their old neighborhoods for support. So historically, African-American social service agencies, for example, that are up in the St. John's area, did you know they bring buses out to Rockwood to pick up kids and bring them back to their community centers 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half away to provide them services? Um, the churches, the historic black churches are up in North Portland. And um, Hispanic Latino, I think there's much more social infrastructure in Rockwood for um, our immigrants from Latin America and South America, but still, um, if you're a refugee, all of your services are in a different part of, of the city of Portland. Um, so we have a lot of people, what's, what's that all mean? We've got a lot of people living there who don't feel like it's home. And if you don't feel like it's home, you don't feel like com committing to your community uh, to start working on engaging and improving it. You know, the refugees are trauma-informed. So our refugees, you know, Oregon 
receives about 1,000 refugees a year from the U.S. federal government resettlement. Um, they have been placing, like, you know, most of them in Rockwood. And um, at Barbary Village, for example, on 188th, just north of Stark, you know, out of the 192 units that are there at Barbary Village, 175 of them are immigrant, are refugee families. And that's fun, that's great. It's actually driven the crime rate way down at Barbary Village. Um, but what's not great is they're all, every refugee you ever meet has a trauma story. And if you're traumatized, you're not moving on in your life until you've dealt with your trauma. So there's a challenge. You know, but the immigrants that aren't trauma, well, some of them are, but some have moved to this country in order to embrace our lifestyle. They're aspirational. They value education. They value social supports. They want to participate in civic engagement, much more so than the legacy white population that used to live in Rockwood. These immigrants are great, and they are our future, and it's very exciting. We term, social, sociologists tell me that we term this low social capital, and what that means is, oh, this is great. Okay, so I downloaded this app from my phone, and it has a countdown timer, and I started it, and it, it, it I, I thought, man, I'm really making time. I didn't set it for 10 minutes, I set it for 10 hours, seriously. <laughs> so, how much more time do I have, Shelly? <laughs> I don't know, you'll be sitting by yourself in 10 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. <laughs> All right. Um, I, th I think we term it, or the sociologists, they term it low social capital. So I want to introduce that idea to you. The idea of low social capital means that if you have low social capital and you have a challenge or a barrier in your life, you don't know who to turn to. Um, if you're a mom with some kids and you've moved here from Mexico and in your life experience no second grade teacher ever helped you when you were a child and then your child is in second grade at Alder Elementary and that child isn't getting any help you're not thinking I'm gonna go talk to that teacher and get my kids some help you're thinking that's how it is and intervening then or, or uh, getting involved at your church at your school, at your healthcare system, to represent yourself and to push for better. You don't ever do that. You don't know who to call when you encounter a barrier. People like us, who are all of us, I promise you, if we're at a chamber meeting, we're high and rich in social capital. People who are high and rich in it, they move on in life. The people who are low in it, they need it fixed. And we can help with that. It has really kind of led, I think, to a, a, a position where, and I, I don't want to offend anybody in the room if I haven't already, but I think historically the city has just not known how to respond. It's just been too much change, too fast, and that's changing. So our perspective as a non-governmental agency, we see the city of Gresham making massive strides even in the last year, even in the last three months in getting a handle around what are we all gonna do together. And it's very exciting. So there's a book from the Brookings Institution called Confronting Suburban Poverty in America. I found out in reading that book that I shouldn't be pissed about all these problems. Every single city in America has a Rockwood. Every single city has a suburban community or county that is now full of low-income people, immigrants and refugees, who are living in, in an environment that was never designed to support them. So I think we're all actually already being recognized nationally as a team of people who are grappling with the same kind of problem that every other city has. And watch out, because in the next two or three years, it's going to be very exciting. OK, uh, so real quick, um, we do a lot of data gathering, both quantitative and qualitative. Rockwood Knox. Every year we, we have 500 kids hit Rockwood and they, they do all these survey work. We also have Rockwood Speaks, which is a in-depth qualitative conversation facilitated by our staff um, in different languages. Have you, ever, have you ever talked about transportation issues in Tongan before? <laughs> I have, and I think, uh, I, I still don't know what they said. <laughs> no, we have, we have translation services. Um, <clears throat> here's what we've learned. We've learned that a lot of people want to move out of Rockwood. There's no surprise. Uh, security, safety, and security issues, of course, are the thing that they identify the most. And then those, uh, the second most is 
um, I'm looking back to my community that I came from. Uh, I would go there if I could. And now we all see that no one's moving. If anything, they're moving out because they're going further out east or down to Canby or I don't know where. But um, uh, there's a desire. There is a desire um, to leave Rockwood. Um, concerned about safety and crime, drug use is, is rampant. Um, how they feel about the police. You don't have to listen to this part. No, it's uh, it's nothing nothing at all that would be a surprise that they want the police to. Um, uh, enforce the laws that are on the books, and they also want the police to be proactive, which is exactly what's been happening in the in the net team. And the fact that the net team is expanding would be supported by our Rockwood Speaks process. That that's what people are looking for. They see these are rank and file people in Rockwood. They see the benefits of what net is doing. Um, church attendance is very low in Rockwood. That relates to social capital. So if you, most people, to develop social capital, they do it in a faith community, not at a Rotary Club or at the school. They do it in a faith community. It's not all bad, though. Um, we measure a question on neighborhood satisfaction every single year, and we are seeing it rise, OK? So people are seeing that some of these changes are having an effect. This last year, we, I think, at 61% said they're satisfied with the neighborhood. We're going to be doing our survey again in about four weeks, and I <clears throat> have a little office pool going. We think it's going to continue to rise. What do they like about Rockwood? They like their library branch, uh, the Rosewood Initiative, which is actually in Portland, their faith community like us. They like Rock the Block. And these service providers specifically were called out more often than others. You know, there's a lot of talk about economic development in Rockwood. I want to just point out that 80% of all the households in Rockwood have earned income. Okay, people in Rockwood work. That's the same as the rest of Gresham. 80% of all households in Gresham, 80% of all Oregon houses have earned income. The problem is that when they do earn income, they just earn less. They're about 33% less on income than the rest of Oregon. And I see some of you trying to squint at these charts. I'll give you this data later if you want it. Um, <clears throat> how do they make up the difference? They make it up by participating in income supports like TANF and uh, free lunch and uh, Social Security or SDI benefits at twice the rate of the rest of Oregon. How do they feel about business and economic development? We see over and over jobs in Rockwood are important. You know, people commute outside of Rockwood to go to work much more often than other people in parts of the, of the city. How they feel about food, housing, and culture. They need a community center. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, talk a little bit about the Sunrise Center as I conclude. Uh, voter participation, extremely low. So in, uh, in the 0 to 14% range. You know, if the people of Rockwood would vote, they're a third of Gresham. They could have anything they wanted, but <laughs> they, they don't participate in any way. We pass out about 4,000 voter uh, registration packets every year in our survey work. How do they feel about parks and community gardens? I'll just net it out that you know they need more. They need more of everything. They need more programming. They need more advanced park. You know the futsal court is a neat new asset. There's no money for uh, programming, so that is the kind of thing that needs to be developed further. And very low health outcomes: um, asthma, birth rate, preterm births, uh, cardiovascular disease are at the record rates for the entire state of Oregon. Healthy food, Josh talked briefly. That's a map of the Rockwood grocery stores that are affordable. There's one uh, down in the southeast corner. The dashed red lines are the buses that don't even run on the weekends. So you can only get a bus uh, Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. in Rockwood. So if you're a mom trying to get food for your kids, that's your, you have no choices. Well, in the last minute, I'm going to talk about the thing that actually everybody's really interested in. Uh, and then we'll have to be out of time. The um, city's um, catalyst site is is right here. This is the Rockwood Town Center basically uh, in this map. Here's the max line. You might have seen in the in the uh, Gresham Outlook the Sunrise Center which is the community center that the uh, Rockwood CDC is in the process of acquiring right now and the city of Gresham uh, thank you counselors that are in the room and, and uh, Josh has approved a $400,000 loan of the $1.35 million that we need to acquire the center. 
And uh, then we are confident that we'll be able to close a loan with InBank for the remaining $1,010,000 and hopefully do that acquisition yet this year. Right next to it in yellow is another major, um, almost six acre development parcel called Sunrise Development. As you drive down Stark, it's the really, really ghetto looking buildings that have the uh, chain link fence. That, that's me, um, proud uh, of what we've done with it. Uh, <laughs> but that's gonna change very quickly. Just last week we signed a, a binding agreement with an investment banking firm and um, are in the process of raising funds to get that project kick started. Um, as soon as we do, those buildings are going down. That might, might even happen yet this year, and uh, we'll be talking a whole lot more about that in the next few weeks and months to come. I think I said everything. I did say everything. And I think we have time for questions. Thank you, Brad. I can hardly wait to see you out there on your track hoe knocking down those buildings. So that's going to be a great sign. Uh, if you want to open it up to questions, you can direct it to any of the uh, presenters up here, or you can throw a jump ball and see uh, who catches it. So no particular rules on this. Uh, have a microphone. Please raise your hand. I'll get the microphone to you so you can be recorded for posterity's sake. So questions? I know this has stimulated some thinking. Don't be bashful. <clears throat> oh, come on. Yeah, sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mario. Chief, I have a quick question. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, low income people receiving Section 8 vouchers. And that relationship between the police department and Home Forward improving. But how can we make it better? How can we make it where um, if families are breaking the law, selling drugs from their apartments or involved in gangs and you know, affecting the uh, livability of their neighbors, how can we improve in that getting them out of, out of those apartments and off public assistance? But also keep in mind protecting, let's say, for example, a woman who is fleeing from domestic violence and the husband keep, husband is uh, is is stalking her and she keeps calling the police and kind of making sure that we don't harm or displace the wrong families how can we moving forward how can we do that well there's it's kind of like a three question yeah. question there that's right uh, the first one uh, i've never been accused of not being able to be heard it's, it's, for, it's for the tv it's for the tv TV <laughs> uh, you know how we get people off yeah. subsidized housing is way above my pay grade I mean that's that's for people much smarter than I how we deal with issues in the apartment complexes is how we one get the apartment complex, which is really a community in and of itself, how we get them involved. Because we'll respond out to incidents that occur in apartment complexes, and nobody will talk to us. We know people saw what happened, but nobody will talk to us. So how do we get the apartment complex people engaged? Because once you engage a community, they'll protect themselves, or at least try to. And the more they protect themselves, the safer that little area is gonna be. One of the issues that, that we deal with is the people that are receiving some kind of uh, assistance, housing assistance, are not being held accountable to who's supposed to be in that apartment. A lot of what we're finding is that a young African-American female with a couple of kids that has been a victim of domestic violence that is getting assistance is allowing people to move into her apartment that should not be living in that apartment with her, creating issues. The elderly grandmother that receives some kinds of assistance allows her grandson to move in who's a gang member who now starts bringing his gangster friends over. So it's kind of 
everything has to kind of come together, but we're starting to see the fruition of a lot of the work that we're doing through our relationship with Home Forward, through uh, Human Solutions. A lot of these areas that are providing services that are trying to make that community engaged, which will make it safer. Hi, this is a question for Josh. Josh, I'm Lori with Adventist Health. I was wondering what the process is for selecting the partners that are going to go into the Catalyst site. Um, I'd love to see that list again, but do you have a process, or is it just anyone who's interested in opening up a space there? How are you selecting the people or the businesses? Hi, Lori. Thank you for the question. Are you talking about the food-based businesses or some of the larger institutions that we've been... Okay, so really the strategy here is um, economic empowerment. So if if there's somebody, who, if it's an organization uh, that has a mission around economic empowerment, either supporting local entrepreneurs, helping people gain access to living wage jobs, uh, giving people resources that help them to get to those outcomes, those are the types of folks that we want to see in the project. Um, and we're not done. We're hoping that we'll have more folks like that that will, that will be added to the project over time. Uh, as for the food piece of it, it's really around trying to support local entrepreneurs to fill the gap left by grocery stores, the fact that we don't have a sit-down coffee shop in the Rockwood Town Center, there's not a good place to get a slice of pizza, basic things um, that, uh, that really any community needs to have. Uh, if we can have a local vendor uh, who's got some skills and experience, that's great. If they've got nothing more than an idea, maybe they're better suited for one of our incubator spaces, and we can pair them up with the Small Business Development Center or one of the number of community development financial institutions that we're working with that provide uh, loans to people to start up businesses. We've got a number of resources for folks if, if they are literally starting from scratch, but it's really around economic empowerment. We've actually said no to some, some folks uh, because they didn't have a, a, a focus or a mission around economic empowerment. There were some social service agencies that really wanted to lease space from us. Uh, they do great work in the community. I think it's fair to say we've got a number of people and organizations in Rockwood who are doing great work around poverty alleviation. What we have not historically had enough of is folks focused on prosperity creation. And that's what this project is really about. So that's the lens through which we're, we're looking at, at folks. Great question. Who else You bet. So my name is Kyle Raker. I'm plant manager of uh, uh, Pella Windows. Uh, we have a factory up on Wilkes Road. Uh, my question is is back back to you, Chief, uh, regarding the apartment and these complex owners, and how do how do we put the onus and responsibility back on them uh, to properly manage um, internally to hold them accountable to the type of neighborhood situation that their property is uh, is providing, and how do they then how do we drive them to create the living atmosphere for the folks in there that maybe they're not comfortable talking to the police officers, maybe they're comfortable talking to their landlord about what they saw, what happened, and then you can better partner with the landlord. It feels like the police department can do so much, but uh, holding the folks accountable that are, that are creating these apartment situations by <laughs> lack of management, lack of accountability, would really go a long ways in helping solve some of the issues that are going on in some of those properties yeah one of the issues that that we have is remember I said a lot of the big apartment complexes in the Rockwood neighborhood are owned by out-of-state corporations trying to find out who owns that apartment complex and talk to someone with some kind of responsibility for it is like trying to find out from a bank who owns a foreclosed property I mean, everybody's going like this. It's not our responsibility. So, you know, the, the council several years ago took courageous action and passed a public nuisance ordinance that allows us, the p police department, along with code enforcement and rental housing, to do step-by-step -step 
building of a what we call a package that we can eventually take control of that property. Now that's at the far end. But you know, I don't know if nowadays the, the structure of fining them, saying we're gonna fine you five thousand dollars. Well, if you have a hundred and ninety one unit apartment getting eight or nine hundred dollars a month and it's costing you six hundred, they'll just keep paying the five grand until at some point you know, they sell the property off. And that's what's happening is a lot of these are investors that are just bought it. All they, they don't wanna put any money in it. All they wanna do is keep it filled until the market turns around a little bit and they can recoup some kind of profit. So we have to move down a road where we're not only hitting them in the pocketbooks, but we're hit, hitting them in the criminal court system. Because I'm telling you, if you've been into some of these apartment complexes, it's almost criminal the way they're keeping these things, the standards, where staircases are crumbling, they're dangerous, the fences are falling down, whatever those things are. Maybe at some point, we need to start holding people criminally liable for that. Now that'll make a difference. However, we know where some of that stuff goes. I'd like to add real quickly that out of the um, probably 2,000 apartment units in Rockwood, only about 15 have on-site management, would be my guess, because you have to have a certain scale. Go, go to Yam Hill on 190th, there's tons of apartment complexes with 12 units. There's, no one, there's nobody supervising that. And uh, so what we're doing at the CDC is we have community navigators, these are young couples who are intentionally moving into these apartments, if you can believe it, uh, for the purpose of changing the environment. Uh, we have two at Barbary Village. That's a big part of the decline by 80% of violence at Barbary Village. Um, now expanded to the Pines just north of it. And we're actively recruiting for uh, Grant View Apartments, which is kind of where Barbary was about five years ago, I think and we're trying to find somebody foolish enough or called enough to go do that. And the manager said they will discount the uh, apartment by 300 bucks a month if we will bring that couple in. So we think that's part of the solution in addition, of course, to just plain old law enforcement. Thank you, Brian. <sighs> Great panel, huh? Yeah. Is that good? Thank you so much. And really, really good questions, too. I want to acknowledge the fact that Councilman Lori Stegman is here. Thank you very much, Lori, for coming. And as many of you know, where her business is, is probably in the very center of that square that we saw earlier of what has been defined as, as Rockwood. So you could call her the heart or the liver or whatever, whatever you want to call, that's where she is located. So thanks for joining us today, Lori. Um, on a personal note, um, whether, whether you own something anymore or not, when you've had it for 40 years, it still feels like yours. And yesterday I drove by our garden center and it's starting to come down. And we don't own it anymore and I'm very grateful for, for the circumstances that is there. But that made those Legos so much more important to me personally today. Because that is, while it feels it's hard, it's personally really hard, it still is an uplifting thing knowing that something else is going to be built up from that. And I can't wait for it to take over some of the emotions I have from the last 40 years for the next 40 years, because I'm going to be here till about 102. So in this job, because I really like my job. So anyway, thank you for indulging me with the Lego story. And we're taking, we're frisking you on the way out. Not a Lego part goes out of this building. I have seven grandchildren and they count them when they come to my house to make sure that every single one is there. You may not take one home as a, as a, mem a memorabilia of today. Thank you again, Riverview Community Bank, for the wonderful sponsorship that you provided this, um, this entire year for 2015. We really appreciate it. And to PGE, as well as Gresham Barlow School District, and Metro East Community Media in 16 font. Thank you very much. Um, we have the flyers on your table. This is how we get better and better and better 
it's because you tell us over and over and over again what to do. So please use this as an opportunity, especially those of you from Pella, thank you for being with us today. Please write down your suggestions. You're fairly new at coming to some of these events. I'm sure you have great ideas of how we can make it better. So, and one of them might be for me to shove it up earlier. Have I forgotten anything? If I haven't, again, this is the last forum for 2015. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you, thanks to you for coming. Great meal choice today, Shelley. Thank you, and thank our panelists so much. It was really, really informative. <laughs>